Um, good evening, everybody. Can I just check that you can hear me at the back of the room? Yes? Good. Okay. Well, a very warm welcome here this evening. My name uh, is Dorothy Neal. I'm the Head of College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, and I'm very pleased to be the one that's... I think I have music going on. Oh. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be able to be here to introduce Professor Jonathan Wyatt this evening and to listen to his lecture. Uh, I think inaugurals are really special events. They're really interesting. I find it very interesting to hear in, in accessible and uh, lay terms about all sorts of different topics that are researched across the college. But they're also special because they're part of a celebration of, in, in Jonathan's case, a promotion to a personal chair. And amongst the audience, we have this really diverse group of people from Jonathan's family, and a very warm welcome to you, uh, old friends, uh, staff, both current and former colleagues from both inside the university, especially right across different subject areas, as well as from outside the university, uh, from his current role and, and from a whole range of times in the past across his career. Um, students and former students. So it's a lovely event to have all of these people from different aspects of Jonathan's life coming together to help him celebrate his promotion and to hear about his work. Now given that there's such a diverse group, it's, it's probably unsurprising that it's such a diverse group given that Jonathan's career has, has all, the, all the way through shown a commitment to working across between academia and practice. And, and I'm sure you'll all enjoy the lecture and then we'll have a reception afterwards just outside the lecture theatre and you're all very, very welcome to stay for that and chat to Jonathan and old friends. So given that we've got this large range of people here, I don't think you'll all know the same range of things about Jonathan's work and career. So I just want to give a little bit of an overview. Um, a very eclectic career, actually. So <laughs> Jonathan began his studies with a first degree in English from the University of York, and then took a postgraduate teaching certificate and a master's in education from Newcastle University. And he did that master's while he was a part-time secondary school English teacher in Washington County, Durham. He then went on to take uh, another master's, this time in counseling practice at Oxford Brookes University, and in the ISIS Center in Oxford. Now, the ISIS Center uh, was the very first walk-in counseling service in the UK. So breaking ground as well as uh, very eclectic. He did that master's part-time as well, alongside working for Oxfordshire's Youth Service. Jonathan then gained his Doctor of Education at the University of Bristol in 2009, which he again undertook part-time, bit of a theme here, this time alongside being Head of Professional Development at the University of Oxford, and he was working one day a week for the NHS as a counsellor in primary care. So Jonathan is clearly an accomplished multitasker, and we've seen that since he's arrived at Edinburgh too. Um, in research terms, his doctoral thesis was entitled Between the Two, a Nomadic Inquiry into Collaborative Writing and Subjectivity written with Ken Gale and supervised by Jane Speedy. Now this was the first collaborative doctoral thesis in social sciences at Bristol, and it won an honorable mention in an international award. It also formed the basis of his first book, which was co-authored again with Ken Gale. Since then, he's co-authored two further books, as well as numerous articles and other publications, all taking forward his interest in collaborative writing autoethnography and the experience of loss. And we're just about to see his first sole authored book be published called Therapy, Stand Up and the Gesture of Writing Towards Creative Relational Inquiry. So Jonathan joined us at the University of Edinburgh in 2013 and, and quite quickly afterwards became the head of counselling and psychotherapy. And whilst in that role, he's been key to the development of a new master's programme in health, humanities and arts and has been a popular teacher and supervisor across the range of courses in that subject area. He's also established a new research centre for creative relational inquiry um, a couple of years ago, 
and the Centre is just about to host the 2019 European Congress of Qualitative Inquiry next month. And uh, around then, Jonathan will be taking up a sabbatical fellowship at our Institute of Advanced Studies in the Humanities. So an incredibly busy, multitasking, eclectic academia practice bridging career. And I'm sure we're going to hear much more about the field of creative relational inquiry tonight. And with, so with no further ado, I want to hand over to Jonathan to present that lecture. Thank you, Dorothy, for that introduction. Um, um, I, was, I was really relaxed about this about, until about 10, 15 minutes ago, and now the terrors hit. Um, can you hear me at the back all right? Okay. And when I was first thinking about this inaugural lecture, I conducted extensive research into what an, an, an inaugural lecture was. Deep, scholarly, extensive research, primarily through Facebook. I had two thoughts that came, that were offered to me uh, through Facebook. One was that I should bear in mind the origins of the term inaugural, which was that it was to do with the, the ancient, in the ancient world, there was a ceremony um, to, to seek the approval of the gods for decisions made by humans. Uh, so the, there was a gathering, a ceremony to test out whether the gods were, in, were, were okay about it, whether the augurs were good. So thank you for being here as my gods. Um, the other thought, which was very uh, common in, in, from my, my Facebook consultation, was that I should do this as stand-up. As <coughs> some of you know, I have a... a, a well, Dorothy's mentioned the book. The book is about the connections between stand-up comedy and therapy and, and writing. Um, so I have, I've had a go at doing stand-up, not always successfully. And there's, sort of, there's, some, there's some really good reasons to not try to do this as stand-up. One is that delightful though the business school lecture auditorium is, it is not the right setting for stand-up. We need a darkened room and a basement and noise and... And the other thing we need is alcohol to start before, before we get started, both for you and for me, uh, not waiting for us afterwards. The, the other reason why stand-up wouldn't work is that I, I'd only last eight minutes, because that's the only material I've got. So you might be pleased about that, but um, I'm not going to do it as stand-up. Um, so I want to speak to this question this evening about creative relational inquiry, what work does it do? The centre for creative relational inquiry that Dorothy mentioned um, was established um, just over a year ago. It still feels very new. And um, the, this slide tells you some of the ways in which we describe creative relational inquiry on the website. This is my one and only bullet-pointed slide, by the way. Um, and, but a way of characterizing creative relational inquiry might be that it's, it's research that is um, concerned and interested in at its center, at its heart, with the relational, whether that's the focus of a research project being about relationships or it's to do with, or, and or it's to do with how the research that's conducted is paying attention to the, re to the research relationships so that the researcher is or are, the researchers are present in the research and visible and explicit about where they're positioned, how they are in the research. It might also be research that is concerned with the, relationing, the relating between the, the research and the wider audience. It's also research that is interested in the process of relating and how relating changes us. The process of relating leading into the create the hyphen of creative relational inquiry is really important. I mean, another thought about creative relational inquiry is how it's seeking to, to foster relations between disciplines that may not necessarily work together traditionally. So, between the arts and the humanities and the social sciences, to seek interdisciplinarity. Um, the uh, the work of setting up the centre 
came at around the same time as I was finishing the, or I was working on the book, but the Routley, two of my publishers, had approved the book, but they wanted a better title. I had a title that said something like Charmed Circles, which doesn't really tell anybody anything about what the book was about. They wanted something methodological in the title. And I had come up with, or actually more accurately, the kind of term creative relational inquiry had kind of arrived in the process of talking and think, talking with others and thinking about this research center and what, it, what we wanted it to do. At about the same time as Radledge were demanding, I did a, a better title for the book and they wanted something methodological. So I stuck creative relational inquiry in the title without having really worked out what it was. So the title then became Therapy Stand Up and the Gesture of Writing, colon, crucially, towards creative relational inquiry. But in keeping with the key uh, theoretical frame that I've worked with over the years, which is primarily through the work of Deleuze and Guattari, Gilles Deleuze, Félix Guattari, who are French 20th century philosophers, here they are. Uh, in keeping with their work, this is quite typical of them. Um, which, was, which, is, which is, I mean, I'm going to simplify it horribly by saying that part of what they were interested in, core to what they were interested in, was in the creating of concepts and seeing what those concepts do. I'm more interested and have been more interested in my own particular take on creative relational inquiry to think with not what creative relational inquiry is, or what it means, but what it does. What does it evoke? What does it motivate? How does it activate us? And that's the spirit in which I want to work with it today. I think um, much, I think I would now, and now that I have the concept, we have the concept, I would characterize my work over the years as being creative relational inquiry. And I, I want, so I'm going to work with it implicitly uh, for, for, for at least some of this, and then more explicitly towards the end when I say more about how I've worked with it in the book. I'll leave them up for now. Um, before I do any of that, I want to, uh, there's a few people I want to say thank you to. I want to say thank you to all of you for being here, for being part of this experience with me, for being my gods, for being my witnesses, um, being my, kind of just being here, for being part of it, it's really, I'm very touched that you're here. I know some of you as well have traveled considerable distances to be here, uh, very appreciative of that, very touched by that. Um, it's also, I want to note that there are people here, as Dorothy says, from various phases of my life. I have my friend Dave here from times when we were in our late teens, and um, we've been continuing to meet and drink beer and eat curry together over the years, and it's fabulous that he's here. I've got um, my friend Mark from my days at York University, and my friend Maggie somewhere, who was my, who was, who used, we used to travel to work together when we taught in Washington County, Durham, when I was an English teacher, and Maggie was teaching at the same school. And um, my friend Alex, and we, she and I worked together at at Oxford. So I'm quite choked. So, and I have my family here, at least some of my family here. Holly and partner Sean, who've come over from Amsterdam to be here. Tess, who's come here all the way from Dundas Street. <laughs> but that doesn't tell any of the story because of the distances in many senses that she's travelled in order for, for me to be here. And um, that's a whole other thing I could talk about. So thank you to you all being for being here. And there's people who are not here that I wanted to be here. Um, so our son Joe, who um, is, uh, lives in Sacramento, um, so just couldn't make the effort to be here. <laughs> but, but he is here in a way because the playlist, the, the music that was disturbing Dorothy when she tried to start was, was from a playlist that Joe made me. The way in which Joe and I connect, uh, well, one of the ways, and it's probably the, 
the main way is that he makes me playlists for special occasions um, as, his, as he tries to continue my musical education. Um, my, my brother and sister, my brother Simon, my sister Nicola wanted to be here but both couldn't be here. My mum, who's nearly 90, doesn't travel, so she would have, have liked to have been here too, but, um, but can't be. But she's in the book. <laughs> so she's here in a way. Two other people um, I want to mention. One is Professor David Moody, who um, he was my personal tutor when I was an undergraduate at York. And, um, I mean, we would call him a personal tutor. He was, the, he was the member of the English department who I had a relationship with throughout the whole three years. He was my kind of regular point of contact. And he, I, had a, I struggled a lot with my undergraduate degree. I did very poorly in it. But he was a constant source of support and attention and presence, and I remain deeply appreciative of, of him. He, um, he has, we, have a, we have an email exchange about whether he could make it here, and he couldn't be here, but he would like to be here. And also Dr. John Crompton, who was my um, tutor when I was training as an English teacher. Um, we've kept in touch ever since. So this was in Newcastle, um, and he would come and, and observe me conduct my lessons, my English lessons. He said he would like to have been here, but if he had been here, he'd have had to have resisted the temptation to sit at the back and open up his notebook and write comments that he would then tear out of his notebook and hand me as he was leaving on the quality of my lecture and the things I should avoid doing. So I'm quite pleased he's not here. So, uh, one further person I want to mention, that, which is going to lead me into talking about my work, which is my father. Uh, my father died in 2003, which happened to be just a few months before I began my doctoral program at the University of Bristol. Um, it was a professional doctorate. The title of the program was of in Narrative and Life Story Research, and it was run by the wonderful Jane Speedy. And um, what that program more than encouraged, almost required me to do, us to do, was to connect the personal with the scholarly, the, the personal with the academic. And so what that program enabled me to do was to begin to write into personal experience in conversation with other authors in conversation with scholarly ideas, with theory. And one of the things I started to do was to write about the experience of loss and the experience of fathers and the experience of being a therapist who works with people who have fathers and who lose fathers and have other losses. And that work led into a series of papers around loss and around fathers and an edited collection about families and a paper with um, Beatrice Allegranti, who's a dance movement psychotherapist, where we had got a bit of funding to run workshops with um, people who'd experienced the loss of someone close using dance movement psychotherapy and writing as a way of processing, for want of a better word, the experience of loss. So there's a whole load of work that's, that's developed out of losing my father. I want to read a short section so I'm going, to, I'm going to show as well as tell this evening, in keeping with creative relational inquiry, the performative encouragement of creative relational inquiry. I'm going to read this short section from a paper um, about loss, fathers, uh, not only fathers, but loss more, more generally. From about four or five years after um, my father died, and where I'd begun to notice a change in the experience of loss, particularly the noticing of, of him being absent, of, um, of the kind of fading of, of him. And I'm going to just read a sort of short section from that. It's not easy listening. I just want you to know that. This is about 
my loss, and it folds in another's loss too. Deleuze and Guattari writes, there are no individual statements, there never are. These remind me of my father, trimming the hedge. I stand on a low wall at the front of my house, carefully working with the wire hooked over my shoulder as he taught me. My father had one leg paralyzed from polio. The hedge that he would trim was much taller than mine, and he would balance unsteadily at the top of a stepladder. Mowing the lawn, I reluctantly plow the lines into the grass and remember how, without his walking stick, he would hop, skip, and jump after the speeding mower. It always seemed an arm's length ahead, and like an enthusiastic toddler, risked escaping his protection and causing damage. The grass at the edges of the lawn and along the flower beds becomes eventually too long to ignore. I do the job as quickly as I can, squatting, and remember him methodically clipping the long grass on the bank at the front of our house, sitting on the ground, his useless right leg folded under him, his left leg stretched out in front. Occasionally, he would pause to wave away the flies from his face. Does loss through its pain, speak of connection. Loss still has presence. Absence is bleak, writing in an attempt to traverse its barren landscape. Loss is conscious of what has been present, is resonant of the lost. With absence, there is forgetting. He is away for much of the time now, not with me, not in front of me. No longer loss. Absence. Is writing my client's brief story a way of my dealing with the impact that she has on me? This writing folds in how her loss speaks to me, how she teaches me about loss. Amy is 25. Her partner died six months ago. One September evening, he'd been drinking. Burdened by debt, distraught at being denied access to his two children, and Amy imagines, because she can never know, with not enough hope and too much anger, he picked up his long, black, studded leather belt in the early hours, formed it into a noose, and hanged himself. Next morning, Amy, who had spent the night with friends, walked along the street toward his flat, saw ambulances, and knew... Today, she knows only that the early summer sun reminds her of time spent with him. And he's not here. He's not here. But, more unbearable, she imagines she will, in time, find another place and catch herself as the grass begins to grow, not remembering. No longer loss, absence. This writing is about these lives, these deaths, my lives, my deaths, and it's none of these. It's about what lies among these lives and deaths, between them, between them and you. It's about the grass that grows between. So, the work that I've um, done uh, alongside that kind of work, work well, it's not, like, it's not different in a way, but has been a kind of different branch of the work, um, has been collaborative writing. Dorothy mentioned this. And um, Jane Speedy was, as well as the director of this program at Bristol, she was the director of a research centre the Narrative Inquiry Center. Uh, and the Narrative Inquiry Center and Jane and Jane's work ha has been at the forefront of thinking about and undertaking and nurturing collaborative writing as a way of doing scholarly work and uh, as a way of thinking explicitly about the process of collaborative writing. Um, there have been a number of books that Jane has soul authored, there's a couple of books she's she soul authored and a, a number that she's co-edited, some with me uh, some of that about collaborative writing. Jane Speedy's 
sole authored book that she was, uh, that was uh, very influential initially. Uh, her first book was Narrative Inquiry in Psychotherapy. And then her second book is called Staring at the Park, which is a beautiful, artistic, and poetic account of the experience of her stroke and its aftermath. She was uh, absolutely, from the outset, encouraging of me and my work, and in particular, encouraging of my work with Ken Gale. And Ken and I started our doctoral program together, literally on the same day. <clears throat> and uh, we began to have ideas about writing assignments together. And Jane managed to get that agreed by the institution which was really some feat I now realize on this side what a task that must have been. But from our point of view, from Ken and, Ken and I's point of view, it just seemed a breeze. We just said to Jane, can we do this? And she would say yes, and we would find a way to do it. She would find a way to do it. Anyway, so that's, I'll come back to that in a moment. But that's Jane. She's more uh, of an artist these days. This is an art example of her work. I've, I've sought her permission to show this as a credit of it at the end. And... Um, I've mentioned Ken Gale, so this is Ken. Ken's at the University of Plymouth. He's an education scholar, but he's a philosophy of education scholar. He's, this is him looking every inch, the uh, thoughtful, serious, Deleuzian, philosoph philosophical scholar that he is. And this is how many people know him. And it's absolutely him. There's also this, which is the Ken that we're also familiar with, um, lively, effervescent. And he and I were allowed to write our collaborative writing book uh, thesis together, which became our book. Um, the, the work that Ken and I did in that thesis, what we were interested in doing, was working, was putting Deleuze and Guattari's concepts to work, in particular in connection with thinking about what we mean by subjectivity, what we mean by the subject, about the person, the notion of, or at least uh, thinking with the notion of the bounded individual humanist subject and disrupting that, which is what Deleuze and Guattari's philosophies do. They work much more with a dispersed sense of subjectivity, that we can never really think about ourselves as being individual bounded human beings, but uh, have it as a sense of the dispersal of subjectivity around and in between not just humans, but the other than human and the more than human. So our work in that thesis was beginning to do that, and we've continued to work together and write together. Uh, not just the two of us, but we have been unashamedly promiscuous in collaborating with a number of other people, including Performance studies scholars, Tammy Spry, Ron Pedius, Larry Russell. We wrote a book together with them. And then with also another book with Suzanne Gannon and Bronwyn Davis in Australia, who, amongst other things, are Deleuze scholars. So the point is, this is, I guess, this is the work that I think people have different takes on this. But this is, this is my take on two things that collaborative write, the work that collaborative writing does. Collaborative writing provides a, a, a space that's congruent with the theories that we're trying to mobilize. So the theories of Deleuze and Guattari and the new materialisms and affect theory, which are all trying to work at how we might understand the subject differently. When you're writing collaboratively, and primarily... Ken and I have wrote collaboratively by sending writing to each other as word attachments, but there are a number of examples of writing groups we've been part of where we've been in the same room as people writing. But all of that activity serves to work with the theory and activate those kinds of theories that we were interested in doing. The second work that collaborative writing as a way of undertaking research and a way of, of inquiry does is to provide an alternative to and a challenge to the uh, prevailing idea of the individual scholar. It's a political act of saying, actually, 
we can't ever think of ourselves as being individual scholars doing our own work in competition with others. We are always, this is to misappropriate Judith Butler, we are always given over to the other. So collaborative writing is, in that sense, activist. It does something. It makes it, it, makes it challenging to the academy and how the academy runs, and, and arguably beyond the academy, to thinking about thinking differently about individual achievement and individual work and encourages, it more than encourages it, it personifies, it does the work of thinking about how collaboration happens. All of which is arguable, of course, so, but that's my take on it. And I want to read now briefly, uh, Ken and I, together with Suzanne and Bronwyn, Suzanne Gannon and Bronwyn Davis, were invited to write a chapter in the most recent SAGE Handbook of Qualitative Research. The SAGE Handbook of Qualitative Research is the Qualitative Research Bible that's produced every five years or so, edited by key figures in qualitative work, Norman Denzin and Ivana Lincoln. We were asked to write about collaborative writing as uh, and the state of the art of collaborative writing, So this, which was very cool. The, I want to read a short section where we're talking about the future of collaborative writing. I'll leave Ken on the screen. His happy face. In years to come, so this is Suzanne Gannon, Bronwyn Davis, Ken Gale and me. <coughs> In years to come, we envisage the same tension as today, dominating academic writing between individualistic, competitive authors caught in the reiterative flows of the already known and the creative flows opened up by collaborative writing in the rhizomatic spaces in between. The act of collaborative research and writing opens up movement of thought, the rupture, the escape from the already known, however small and inconsequential each escape may seem to be. Oppressive orders, while painful, cannot destroy creativity. Collaborative writing in opening up the space in between generates creative flows, opens up the possibilities of lines of flight. Lines of flight can always be re-territorialized, brought back into the fold of the dominant order. And so it's a continual process, a continual willingness to engage in a betrayal of the dominant order. What collaborative writing will become cannot be predicted. Should we pin down what it will become, we would, be, would have betrayed its generative force. We're aware our discussions of collaborative writing and inquiry here have been, as in, in this chapter, have been anthropocentric, with reason and affect centered on the human and on human modes of thinking, feeling and being even as we write about entanglements and assemblages that encompass the more or other than human, even as we experiment with philosophers who might help us think and write otherwise, it's difficult to think beyond our human habits and histories. What are the implications for collaborative writing as we push toward post-human modes of research? The post-human subject, as Rosie Bredotti writes, is materialist and vitalist, embodied and embedded, firmly located somewhere. Bredotti suggests that a post-human orientation requires an ethics of experiment with intensities and, quote, enlarged, an enlarged sense of interconnection between self and others, including non-human or earth others. It promotes a strong sense of collectivity and relationality and sees a central role for creativity. And whether obliquely or directly, collaborative writing will address the, fl the flows of power and affect of collaboration itself. In the research assemblage of collaborative inquiry, co-authors will open the black box of social inquiry to scrutinize the micropolitics of the work they do together. So that's the creative relational work of collaborative writing. And I then um, kept working with, kept thinking about writing and um, 
thinking with Deleuze and Guattari, thinking with affect theory, as I worked on this book that actually has just come out. And, um, and in that book, as I was saying at the start, I do some work to try and get creative relational inquiry to, um, to come alive. Uh, the book idea is that it's interested in the s connections and slippages between stand-up comedy and therapy and writing, personal writing, everyday writing, writing as inquiry. Um, so, for example, how... And I, want to, I, I, I wanted to put those into some kind of conversation to see what happens. And, for example, they're kind of, by the connections I mean, for example, how the performer, stand-up performer, Scott Gibson, does a set about his father and about becoming a father himself, or rather not wanting to become a father himself, partly because of his relationship with his father. And then I have tell us there's a story of how of, our, of my work with my client, Carl, and the story of our work runs throughout the book, where he talks about his father, and he talks about being a father himself. And, and then there are these stories that I, the, the further stories that I tell about my own father. And so I was interested in what happens if we allow those milieus to speak to each other. As I think with theory, to borrow Jackson and Matt Sy's phrase, as I think with theory, and in particular as I think with creative relational inquiry. So here's a couple of ways that I would say that creative relational uh, does work. The creative relational inquiry as a concept does work for me in the book. One is that it's, it gives an invitation to, a permission to, put those different medias into conversation with each other. It says, what happens if you make them work alongside each other? These medias that don't obviously fit together. What happens if you put them together, put them into conversation, if you work with them, work across them to see what happens? Creative relational inquiry as a concept enables me to think with that. The other thing that creative relational inquiry as a concept does for me in the book is, is make me look at the micro elements of the process of relating. So I think about stand-up being, with creative relational inquiry, inquiry, I can't just think of that as being about what the stand-up performer does, what they say, what they do on the stage. It's about everything else that's happening at that moment. It's about the cramped bodies in the room round small tables in a sweaty, overcrowded room, the red walls. It's about the music that the, 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 the tech person's deciding to play. It's about the announcement that comes over that we've got five minutes before we start. It's to do with also how there's a sense of flow happening in the room, the, the, the expectation that's around before the <coughs> performance starts, the way expectations are raised, the way tension is created, how that changes to, at times, relief and release, how there's anxiety present sometimes, and that's all happening, it's all of that, all of that is happening. And so that creative relational inquiry demands I pay attention to that um, process of relating, all of that relating together. <clears throat> Similarly, in therapy, it's never just about what I might say as a therapist or what I might say as a client. It's about everything else that's happening. It's about the space between the chairs. It's about the color of the carpet. It's the time of day. It's the cat that walks past the window at that particular moment. It's the muffled noise from the next door room the, where a therapist and a client are talking. All of that is in the mix of the process of relating. And similarly, in writing, 
it's not just about putting fingers on keys. It's about what's happening out of the window in the early morning, the light that comes on at 7 a.m. when I'm writing, or the, the, the sense of who it is I'm writing with at that moment, whether that's the, the sense I, I have of the, the person who might read this, or the theorist that I'm working with, or Carl, who's my client, whom I'm writing about. How high my desk is, what else I've got on my desk. All of that is part of what Deleuze and Guattari would talk, call the assemblage. So when we think about the subject, for Deleuze and Guattari, we need to think about the assemblage. It's not just for human bodies. So I'm going to read... So, that, so, those are the, so that there's a two ways in which creative relational inquiry as a concept does some work for me in the book. I'm going to read uh, an abbreviated version of a chapter where uh, I'm working with uh, a, a story from the everyday of being at work and seeing my client Carl and being at, that, being at a stand-up gig. And I'm working with this sense of flow and affect and assemblage in each of those different spaces. <clears throat> um, there is some colloquial language in this chapter. I want to acknowledge that, I swear, in the chapter. Not least in the title of the chapter, which is Three Shits. I begin with a quote from um, a book called Ordinary Affects, which is a beautiful book by Kathleen Stewart. I can recommend it. If you kind of want to weigh into some of the theoretical ideas I've been alluding to, this is a very good way in. Um, it's beautiful. Ordinary Affects is the name of the book. The title of the chapter, Three Shits. I begin with this quote from Stewart. Ordinary affect <coughs> is a surging a rubbing, a connection of some kind that has an impact. It's transpersonal or pre-personal, not about one person's feelings becoming another, but about bodies literally affecting one another and generating intensities. Human bodies, discursive bodies, bodies of thought, bodies of water. Shit one. This morning, my office at the university, early, winter, it's dark, but I get the sense of light somewhere beyond in hiding. A silent room on a silent corridor, except I hear the low, slow, relentless hum of the systems that keep this building breathing. Barely. It's a building on life support. It's difficult to make out this hum, its specifics. Yeah, that one. Hear it? There. Distant. Back. Back beyond the wall. That wall. Way back. Heating, I think. Yes. A boiler, perhaps. Still. Wait. Listen. Heating hum. And then an interruption. Water. Pipes. Waste. Shit. Somewhere in the building there must be someone else. I thought I was alone. In the office yesterday, <coughs> I spoke to a colleague. She apologized. She didn't need to, but she did. There's too much to do, she says. Whatever she does, she's always behind. She will keep going and keep going and then take leave and on the first weekend, get sick. Sick like the others who are not here because they've been made ill. I tell her, please don't worry. I understand. And I know as I say it, that understanding, such as it is, is impotent. This is a sick building. Shit seeps from the pipes into the walls and through the floors, creeps through the cracks and the corners into our lives and into our bodies. I feel alone. The corridor is empty and dark. My neighbor's offices are empty and dark. <coughs> Breathe. Below my computer screen there's a card, blue and green, hand drawn, a gift, a reminder for life, a reminder of life, a reminder 
of love. It speaks to me in black, irregular letters, the words, don't forget to breathe. Shit two. Room four at the counselling service on a Tuesday evening. I left my office with relief as the day darkened, and leaning into the cold easterly wind, I walked the 30 minutes here through the green of the meadows and along the busy rush hour streets. Carl undoes his suit jacket and looks up at me. He doesn't hesitate. I've hated this week. Nothing completed, nothing achieved. Just get up, go to work and trudge through the daily bog, through the crap. Stupid directors from the top, pointless meetings, people in the team falling out and one of them brings me her crumbling personal life like she thinks I can resolve it. Sorting out her crap's not my job and I couldn't anyway, but what do I say? I do my best. And then I go home and it all starts again. My own crap all starts again. It's all still there. Everything I left when I walked out the door in the morning it hasn't gone away. She's distant and the boys are out either out avoiding homework or home and sullen, and the TV is hopeless. More crap. There are many possible responses I could make to this. <clears throat> Most would be harmless, at least. Most will enab would enable him, enable us, to take what he's said and work with it. I could ask him, for example, to say more about the specifics. I could inquire into the details of, say, his colleagues' difficulties, wondering as I ask if they have echoes of his own, or the particulars of the interactions at home, or I could just nod. I could do the cliched therapist thing, go, uh -huh. I could do nothing. I could wait. Each of these might open something up might prompt us to take this further, might help, but I don't do any of these. Instead, when he ends with, and the TV is hopeless, more crap, I say, that's a lot of crap. And he raises his eyes again to meet mine and retorts, you don't say. He doesn't look away, he doesn't smile, there's no warmth in his sarcasm. It was the wrong moment for me to offer something light. I misread him, I misread it, the this, what was happening just now, I misread us, the way he looked, the tone of his voice. As a therapist intervention, following a client making himself vulnerable, that's a lot of crap, did not rank amongst my best. I half smile. It's a weak move, but it is an acknowledgement, if nothing else. After a few seconds, he looks down, sits back, and brings his hands together on his lap. It's too much, he says. There's too much that can't be fixed out there in all of it, work and home. It's not what I thought it would be like. Yeah, I can see that, I say. Nor this here, he says. This isn't what you thought it would be like, I ask. No, I didn't expect you to try to be funny. No, I say. I didn't expect you to compound my crap with your own, if crap can be compounded. Shit three, Tuesday 24th of February, The Stand Comedy Club, York Place, Edinburgh. <coughs> You've been queuing outside for half an hour along the street where the trams run. You're not the first in line, not the last, and you think you're early enough to get a seat, and if you're lucky, one with the table. It's blowing a gale, and though your coat is thick, the chill cuts you between hood and face, and you don't chat to your mate, you just focus on trying to keep warm. The queue starts to move at last, and you head down the twisting black metal stairs to the club. It's in the basement, and it's low through the door, and you feel you have to stoop, though you don't. You owe your dues to the smiling member of staff with dyed red hair, and it's just a fiver for tonight's show, and you've ordered your tickets online, so it's easy. You show your credit card, and you're in. You pass another smiler on your left. She offers you a blue-yellow Bright Club badge with a duck. 
which you take. And there's the bar on your right. But you go straight to the spare table you've spotted because the bar can wait. And you and your friends sit, shed coats and scarves and gloves and fold them under your chair. And you see the sweets on the tables and you know they're there to give you the sugar rush and make you more available for laughter. And you think, God, how manipulative. An hour later, you're on your third drink. And the sweets are all gone, what with you and your mate and the two girls in front of you with their backs to you whose drinks are on your table and who've been sharing the sweets. There's no seats left anywhere and there's people behind you standing with their backs to the wall and their drinks on a shelf. There must be, all about 60 or 70 people in here and it's tight, but you are never that good with numbers and especially not after a few drinks and a load of sugar. And at last the lights dim and you know it's been coming, what with the five minute warning they gave you and the announcer with the big Scottish voice says, give a huge hand to your host for the evening, Jay Lafferty. And she's not what you're expecting. She's young and cute, and in a couple of paces from the door to the right, she's onto the stage. It's only about the size of your table, the stage, and she makes the room fill with her voice through the mic, and you already like her because she's relaxed and confident. She does the usual comedian thing of getting people to put up their hands and seeing who's from where and taking the piss out of the English and asking the ones who sat at the front where they're from and imitating their accents because she, but she's kind and funny and everyone loves her and she tells everyone about what Bright Club is about as if they didn't know it's academics doing stand-up about their research and they're not professionals so don't give them a hard time, she says. Give her a hard time instead if you must. And if you do, she'll fuck you over, so don't bother trying. Then she says to the guy at the front right at the end, the guy at the front right at the end, OK, so you start the clapping. Do you think you can do that? Which makes him laugh. And then we'll go around the room, she says, as she sweeps her arm across like a wave, like a surge of laughter. And we'll invite the first act on stage and give him a warm welcome. And I know you're going to love him. And he's going to make you laugh and think at the same time. Please welcome to the stage Jonathan Wyatt, therapy on a scale of one to five. Sweep, sweep, sweep. Clap, 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 clap. A quiet grumble building to almost a tune. As he comes out from the same door on the right and he's carrying a teacup. Why a teacup? And he shuffles past a man with the longest legs you've ever seen, and then the woman behind the guy who started the clap, so to speak. And then the guy himself who started the clap. And then past Jay Lafferty, who stepped back to give him just enough room. And then he's on the stage, that tiny wooden stage, and he puts his cup on the table in front of him, where there are two people looking up and watching for what he's going to be like. And then he puts his right hand on the mic stand, and his left on the mic. And he takes the mic from the stand, and he lifts the stand and reaches it behind so it's out of the way. And he's wearing a flowery blue button-down shirt, like a shirt you wear when you're trying to be someone who performs stand-up. <laughs> and he's in jeans and Converse boots that you can just make out between the heads of the two girls and the bushy-haired bloke and the bearded bald one right near the front. And he looks like he might be a bit nervous, but he's not shaking or anything. And then he says... This isn't part of my set, but you might like to know that doing stand-up is a very good laxative. Ordinary affects that flow from and between bodies in rooms, in buildings, in spaces, with or of rooms, buildings and spaces, affecting one another and generating intensities, human bodies, discursive bodies, material bodies, bodies of thought, bodies of water, sad bodies, troubled bodies, laughing bodies, who might say in that moment of abandon that they couldn't give a shit about anything. So, that's a flavour of the book. It's not all got swearing in it. But that bit did. Now, I've been talking obliquely and explicitly about the work that creative relational inquiry can do, but the centre and the concept is much bigger than me, and I don't want to end it with me. 
I want to end it with more in keeping with the inclusiveness and the provocativeness of the concept and the centre by uh, inviting just a few people who will speak for a minute about the work that Creative Relation Inquiry might do. They know who they are. I'm not going to pick on anybody. So we'll begin with Annie.